All right, and uh, let's uh, let's get started with uh, um, some some introductions, and and maybe we'll start with uh, Tom Peters, and uh, Tom's at NDSU, and and also. Uh, Associated with the University of Minnesota, he's a uh, associate professor, a professor, and extension agronomist, and he works on uh, sugar beet weed management. And uh, so, Tom, um, maybe if you want to introduce yourself, and and uh, if you'd give a just a real brief synopsis on um, from a weed science perspective, um, what kind of uh, techniques uh, or methods do you um, recommend to uh, manage manage the development of resistance or manage resistance once it occurs. Thanks, Bruce, um, and I appreciate the invitation to participate today. So I think your introduction for me was fine. Um, uh, University Extension is my second career. My first career was in industry, so I've been in the extension system since 2014. So um, let's let's start with being proactive. Let's start with preventing resistance. And the best the best advice that I can provide on the weed control side is change your herbicide program frequently. And what I like to advise is you keep records. You write down what you did in a field last year, the year before what you did this year, and then map it out as to different active ingredients, different families of herbicides that you can use in future years. One of the advantages of crop rotations is it opens the door to more actives. So I, I like to see at least three crops. So I know in, in Southern Minnesota where you're at, Bruce, um, it's corn and soybeans. Well, how about getting a third crop in the rotation, which usually adds more families of, of pesticides. So within a, pe a, a crop, and let's just pick on sugar beets, my favorite crop. I, I try to recommend an integrated plan that includes soil applied and post-emergence herbicides. And when we can, we try to do tank mixes because I think mixtures of herbicides are one way of, of, of reducing the likelihood for uh, resistance for occurring. So how, how do you spot the early signs of resistance? Well, and, and it's an interesting year to be talking about that because it's hot and dry right now and lamb's quarters isn't dying very quickly with Roundup. So the first thing that I like to say is, is look to see if there's dead plants, dead weeds right next to live plants, live weeds. That's usually a sign of trouble. But if you do see um, that situation occurring, that could probably be the early onset. Um, Generally, weed resistance doesn't follow a pattern in a field. So you're not going to see one area of the field with more resistance than the other. It's going to be hit or miss through the field. But look for live plants next to uh, dead plants, or maybe something in between where there'll be a dead plant, um, water hemp completely fried by herbicides next to one that's damaged, next to one that's, that's living um, and very healthy. That to me, Bruce, is the sign of, of resistance uh, coming on. Now for post-emergence herbicides, it's a lot more difficult just because there's a rate response that occurs and a, a length of control response. So I will tell you that um, trying to determine or detecting resistance with soil residual herbicides is a lot more difficult. I think I'll stop and you can move on to the next uh, participant, Bruce. Okay, th thanks, Tom. And, and uh, we'll come back to you with, uh, with some more controversial uh, questions in a bit. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm gonna start uh, with Ian McRae. Uh, Ian, uh, 
Uh, maybe uh, just like uh, Tom did, uh, introduce yourself and and uh, and then uh, maybe your philosophy on detecting and managing uh, post-emerge insect uh, insecticide resistance. I know you work with uh, with potatoes, and and uh, you've got some pests there that are uh, infamous for resistance to Colorado potato beetle. You've also been involved with. Uh, Looking at the chlorpyrifos resistance in, in uh, two spotted spider mites. Tom Peters mentioned that they like uh, tank mixes to manage resistance. Um, I, my question, one of my questions for you up front is do you have the same philosophy when it comes to insecticides, uh, mixing, mixing different modes of action? So, Ian? Thank, oh, thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, the. Um... Uh, actually, with insecticides, we find that the data shows that it's not as effective as rotating the chemistries. Um, part of it is that we have uh, multiple generations in a year. We're talking about you know shorter periods of time. So what we found is is actually if you start tank mixing, what you really end up doing is selecting you know for resistance against both of those chemistries rather than a single chemistry. So practically with insecticides, you're better off rotating the single modes of action over time uh, and hitting separate generations. And you can, you can do that because many of the insects that we're dealing with uh, have multiple generations in a year. It's one of the reasons why, you know, typically the, the insects that develop resistance most frequently are ones that have multiple, it's one of the characters of them. And so, yeah, if you rotate the chemistries rather than tank mixing, you'll probably keep tools in the toolbox for a longer period of time. So that's, it's a little different. I've heard, um, um, you know, I can understand what they're doing in wheat science, but it's a little different with, with the insects. Um, as for recognizing it, well, it, yeah, it's, it's like Tom says, sometimes you have a, you know, there's a lot of reasons for a, a chemical failure. It might not necessarily be resistance. So in our case, we like to confirm it before we do that. Um, there's a couple of things you, you can be looking at. I mean, if you, there's a couple of warning signs to it. If you're seeing rate creep, over uh, a period of years, that's always a, a you know a sign that you're starting to see starting to see a problem. If an insecticide is not providing the same length of of uh, control that it used to, that's also a, a, another another issue. So that you can usually kind of get little warning bells that we're starting to that we may be starting to see some problems. Um, you do have instances where you will have a very sudden response. Uh, it's um, it, I wouldn't say it's rare, but it's not unusual. Um, and sometimes that can be resistance to a single AI, or, or sometimes it can be something like cross resistance, where an insect has developed resistance to another insecticide and, and you know, it crosses over to the other mode of action. But if you're looking for, if you're looking for resistance and you're, you're starting to see kind of less of efficacy of a chemistry over years, that's always a warning bell. Um, once you do see a failure of an insecticide, there's a couple of ways to look and determine whether or not it's just resistant. As, as Tom says, if you've got a lot of dead beetles out there and you have a bunch of them that are still alive and healthy, you've probably got a portion of the population that's resistant to that insecticide. Uh, there's ways of actually doing kind of other tests as well. If you suspect it's going on, you've got a problem with chemistry. Uh, there's something called a dip test. You can prepare insecticides at slightly different concentrations and dip them in with a tea strainer is what we actually do. Um, and you can kind of do that in a mason jar. There's a, a uh, actually there's a paper out of the Ontario uh, Ministry of Ag has a, a really good description of how to how to kind of do that at home. So you know there are kind of different tests you can do. Uh, the surefire test for us is we maintain susceptible population colonies. You know colonies of susceptible Indian insects. They've never seen you know they're, this kind of population of insects has never seen an insecticide. So we calculate out how much insecticide it kills, takes to kill them. You compare it to your field population and you get an estimate of you know, what kind of level of resistance you're seeing out there. Um, other than that, uh, I guess I'd respond to the kind of questions. We, like Bruce says, we're dealing a lot with uh, resistance in, in potatoes simply because they're very heavily managed. And Colorado potato beetle is like one of the poster children for resistance. So yeah, we see a lot of this. Thanks, Ian. Um, maybe uh, Dean Dean Melvick is an uh, extension plant pathologist, and, and uh, maybe he can, he'll wants to address a little bit uh, 
you know, some of the aspects of resistance to, to fungicides uh, um, and, and maybe even a touch a little bit on, on, uh, on some of the resistance, uh, uh, to, uh, in res uh, post plant resistance and to soybean cyst nematode. Um, Dean, as far as managing uh, in, in, um, fungicides, uh, do you lean more towards the towards the uh, wheat science approach or or the uh, uh, insect approach that um, were just mentioned? So, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, I think either approach would work. The reality is, we we don't have that option of of a highly effective products that are widely available that are single mode of action very often anymore, especially for corn and soybeans. You know, the mixtures have become by far the most common. And it wasn't that long ago that headline and, and uh, you know, quadris were, were commonly applied alone, but those are very rarely used and very, very rarely recommended. So, you know, a mixture seems to work just fine. I mean, fortunately for corn and soybeans, we have not had major issues in most cases with with resistance to fungicides you know with a major exception right now being the fungus that causes frog eye leaf spot but you know, there are a couple of reasons for that um, you know until you know the past 10 15 years fungicides were not widely used on those crops as we all know therefore the long-term exposure is is much less than say some other crops such as sugar beet or some vegetable and fruit crops that where they're used much more intensively and fungicide problems have been more common. So, you know, again, the reasons for failure of a fungicide are, are more often related to coverage rate and timing probably than truly resistance in, in most cases. Um, you know, I'm mainly referring to the foliar products, but of course the seed treatment side of this is a big picture too. And that's a different, um, set of considerations there, although they too can have problems. But, you know, the main difference there is if you put a fungicide on, you know, a large portion of a foliar product, um, a large portion of the fung fungus in that, in a field is exposed to the product. Where as a seed treatment, you know, the only a small portion of all the fungi in a field in the soil are actually exposed to the product. So therefore, the risk is much lower in the, in the exposure time and, and the overall, um, I guess, risk based on exposure is a lot less. Although there have been some reports of reduced efficacy of seed treatments now too, as they're becoming more and more widely used as they have. Some of the products being used on you know, every acre and almost every crop from year after year after year. So there is good risk there too, but certainly lower than the, fol than the foliar side. But again, in terms of the diseases we have on corn and soybeans in Minnesota, uh, the fuller diseases, the biggest risk concern right now for fungicide resistance is the frog eye leaf spot. And that isn't because we in Minnesota have created this situation. The fungus has very likely come in from other states where they applied fungicides frequently enough to create that resistance. And that's primarily to the, the Stravillia and the QOI class of fungicides. We don't have much evidence of resistance to others at this point in time. So mixtures of fungicides are still quite effective as long as they contain an active ingredient at a concentration high enough of something other than Strabillion and QOIs to control it. So we still have good ways to manage it with fungicides, but we can't rely on Strabillions. Um, so those are a few comments that I can start with. Anything else, Bruce, that I didn't touch on that you would want so, me to at this point? So this, this, uh, you know, maybe Tom, uh, Tom can uh, address this too at some point. But so, is are the mixes uh, with fungicides? Are they there to increase efficacy on individual fungi, or or more there to broaden the spectrum of what diseases are are controlled? I, I'd say a little bit of both, but I think more so to broaden the spectrum. <laughs> Yeah, and, and to reduce the, the risk of resistance development as well. So I think there's there are three purposes there. Okay. But oh, one more thing I'll mention is there's, of course, the host resistance side is a very important part of the plant disease management picture. And you know, most of our important diseases do have resistance um, 
bred into most many different hybrids and varieties. And so that's still an important part of the management practices. And you know, having a, a highly resistant variety dramatically reduces the population of the fungus that can develop in a field and hence also the level of resistance that might develop over time. Um, so that's, it's an integrated approach that we, that we use almost by default, often if we use a fungicide. I'll, I think I'll stop there. Okay, thanks Dean. Um, Ken Dean, Dean uh, uh, Ken Osley is an extension entomologist, uh, works uh, on corn insects primarily and, and particularly corn rootworm. Um, Ken, Ken is probably real uh, uh, capable of addressing uh, uh, resistance to uh, corn, uh, resistance of corn rootworms to BT, but, and also- uh, And I would say- Oops. Um, somebody, did I miss somebody? Hey, Ken, you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was Tom or who was who was uh, uh, in there, but um, Dean mentioned uh, the seed treatments, and maybe you want to touch a little bit on on resistance to BT versus some of the app plant, the inferotype insecticides, and how how those differ. Well, I think from my perspective, what resistance does is just increase risk, and as growers try to deal with it, that means they're increasing costs of management or they're, in, they're suffering more unexpected losses. And um, when we deal historically, looking at things like insecticides and high rate seed treatments, um, they were never incredibly effective. It was mainly a strategy to protect plants from lodging. Um, with the BTs, the it became possible to achieve a very high level of root protection. And unfortunately in agriculture, as we see repetitively looking across the disciplines, when we've got a highly effective product widely used repetitively over years, we select for resistance. So the shocking thing with corn rootworms is that BT resistance appeared within six years of the widespread use of the technology. And it has proceeded to um, work through all of the available traits. So at this point in Minnesota, we not only have resistance um, to individual traits, but we have resistance to trait combinations. So a lot of the emphasis on pyramided traits was designed to deal with you know, resistance to single traits, but unfortunately you can also get resistance to however many traits are in a package if your selection pressure is severe enough. So the challenge for growers is to think of field backgrounds, the status of rootworm populations and resistance is just this big mosaic they're trying to manage in the landscape and um, that means they don't really know what they're getting in fields. And uh, the case in point this year is that all conditions have been pointed at a, an increase in corn rootworm injury. Uh, so whether we're talking abundant egg laying last fall, good overwintering conditions, early planting this spring, um, not much rainfall uh, to drown larvae as they established. And now the drought stress, all of those factors are leading to uh, the potential for an unexpected level of injury from corn rootworms. So how do you know you got a corn rootworm problem? And, uh, you know, obviously we're concerned about root injury, but that's below ground. So many growers won't actually be seeing that unless they're deliberately out there digging roots. Um, so they're dealing with secondary symptoms of issues such as growth effects, which will be pronounced during the drought year. Um, dealing with lodging, which may be diminished if we don't get thunderstorms um, and ultimately yield impacts, which 
are typically accentuated dramatically uh, during a drought. Um, but in the end, the two most important indicators of what's happening are the root injury and the sheer number of beetles that are emerging. So just to give you a quick example, when we're dealing with the EPA criteria for uh, suspecting resistance, which is a half a node uh, of root injury in these pyramids, by the time you get to that stage in a field, um, recent research has shown that you're looking at probably over 250,000 beetles per acre already emerging, which are mainly resistant, 33% uh, lodging incidents in a typical field in that situation, and uh, roughly a 10% yield drop. So, um, the penalties can be fairly severe for not recognizing a developing resistance issue. Um, so the, the challenge is how do we tell? And the bottom line is the best tool available is simply to scout using sticky traps. Okay, Ken, I got uh, one question came in here while, we, while you're on the rootworm topic and, and that is, uh, when should we start doing root digs? Well, this year, rootworm development has accelerated. We had war much warmer temperatures early. And of course, we've continued to see um, elevated temperatures. So I don't know what you've been seeing out there, Bruce, but earlier this week when I was looking at root systems, I was seeing seconds and thirds commonly. Um, of the three larval stages in the cycle. Uh, they pupate for about 10 days. So, you know, you're probably looking at peak injury probably occurring or well in hand by, you know, 10 days from now, certainly two weeks from now, which is a, ahead of when we'd normally be thinking of digging. Now, keep in mind that BT traits uh, slow development of susceptible larvae. Um, and so their injury will peak later. Um, so in a susceptible population, you may not see peak injury in a typical year um, until, you know, maybe August 10th or, you know, August 5th, August 10th. That will be certainly moved up this year. Um, but if you go early, just look and see what kind of larvae you're still seeing in the root system. Um, and if you're still finding larvae, you might want to hold off a little bit. Yeah, yeah we were last week, we, we floated some larvae. They were mostly first and a very few seconds. And we're gonna, we haven't looked again this week, but I would suspect we're pretty close to what you were seeing, Ken. So. They're moving, moving really fast, and uh, we're kind of a little bit, a uh, little bit on the dry side here at Lamberton, and and mm -hmm. some of that corn is starting to look pretty, pretty ugly in some of the some of the non BTs. So, yeah, in some of our plots at Rosemont, where you've got a sand gravel layer down about five six feet, and, and uh, moisture issues when we were facing drought. Uh, even after a half inch of rain, uh, leaves were rolling on Monday morning by 10 a.m. So certainly seeing drop, uh, growth effects. Okay. Um, well, last but not least, uh, we've got Dan, Dan Nielsen on the phone. He's uh, this year's president of the Minnesota Independent Crop Consultants. And Dan, you look at a lot of fields and, and you know, I'm sure you've seen some resistance issues firsthand. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you're probably as qualified as any, or better qualified than, than anybody on, on the panel is to address, you know, if you do, do see resistance problems, how do you work with, with the growers to, to get things resolved? Gotcha. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, uh, you know, it's like, you gotta be out there looking. 
You know, it, it just uh, everybody kind of alluded to that effect, but it's like, you know, on that, if we do have some weeds that are not dying exactly, you know, like what Tom was saying, there's a couple that are good, one that's dead. It's like, why is that? So, you know, just looking at that and asking a lot of questions uh, to the farmer, especially if it's a new farmer, or a new field in my, you know, just knowing what happened there in the past. And if it's a repetitive chemical year after year, obviously that's the red flag of what's going on. But when we start seeing some holes, you know, trying to catch them earlier rather than later, whether that's rootworm here or whether that's weeds, it just being out there, I think is huge. Whether you're the farmer doing that yourself or you're hiring somebody to do that, catching that, you know, and I, you know, we had, kind of talked about, you know, a lot of us have talked about there. Tom maybe did having a plan and rotating things. It's huge. You know, any, any time anymore though, with all these generics out here and stuff, and I guess this point hasn't really been brought up, but it's like, there's different names, but the same base chemistry to the farmer, he, he don't have a clue. It's a different name. So let's put that out there where it's the same product we've used the last few years. So just kind of maybe simplifying that a little bit here to the crowd, but you know, it just being out in the field and observing what's going on is huge. You know, whether that's the water hemp or the ragweed not dying off very well with, you know, some of the diphenyl ethers, you know, that, you know, we, we went through a lot of, I think herbicides is a little easier to think about because we've all seen a lot of that, whether that's back in the pursuit days or the roundup days where it slowly isn't working to where all of a sudden it's a disaster and it should be a disaster. It should be a slow work up to that for the most time. And we should have caught that, you know, if we're out there looking where we change the modes, we change stuff up. I just, I like that's, that's been talked about here a lot where if we change stuff, hopefully we'll get away from some of this resistant issue out there. Does that kind of cover what you're thinking, Bruce? Or? Yeah, that's, no, that's very good. Uh, um, you know, you, you know, you and the farmers have the advantage of seeing this stuff happen, but for myself, uh, when I found, when somebody co uh, contacts me with the problem, it's, you know, the horse is already out of, out of the barn and, and, you know, you're, you're trying to put out a fire that might not, you might not actually be able to put out anymore, uh, you know, right. using and, a particular and I, product. And all you guys are seeing the disaster, you know, and we got to kind of weed out. It's like, okay, I think that was part of the, the write-up. It's like, was it the day you sprayed? Was it the additive you put in? You know, all these questions I say we ask, you know, what was it something just environmentally on that application that we had, you know, a poor control? If we rule that out and it's like, no, it's not that. This is the beginning of a resistance. You know, we need to change things up, whether that's this year or whether that's next year. You know, that's just something to be out there taking notes of there and figuring that out. We do have every once in a while where, you know, we didn't put the right additives in or we got this additive and it wasn't what we wanted at all. And yeah, we didn't have good control. We put the proper additive in and maybe controlled it great, but just trying to weed that out, trying to look at the paperwork and the science behind what went in that to figure out if it is a true resistance or what it is. Hey Bruce, can I make a comment or two? You sure, you sure, you sure can, man. And uh, let me just, uh, before, you, before you do, Tom, um, We've got uh, we've got some questions coming in, and and we'll 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 try to address these as we go through. But uh, if you do have a question, uh, just make uh, enter them into that question and answer section. So, so go ahead, Tom. I want to reiterate what Dan said about scouting. There's nothing that replaces scouting, and you need to trust your eyes. So I've heard uh, producers sometimes say that. Well, you know, I saw some plants that weren't dying, but my first instinct was to blame somebody. I thought it was my guy that was making the sprays or uh, maybe it was the retailer. Um, what they were seeing was the onset of resistance. And in year one, it might be a few plants, a few skips. Um, in year two, it might be an area maybe a hundred feet in diameter. And then by year three, boom, it's the whole field. And by then it's too late. And I'd much rather address weed resistance in year two than certainly year three. 
So trust your instincts, trust your eyes, because usually what you're seeing is real. No, that's, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good, very good point. Uh, well, really a story about when we discovered uh, uh, resistance to, so, uh, prethroid resistance to soybean aphids, and we'd sprayed, uh, sprayed an experiment, and uh, we went, I went out there to start raiding it, and, you know, stuff wasn't dying, and so my first, first thought was, uh, you know, we did something wrong with the application, um, and we were trying to sort that all out, and then all of a sudden the phone calls came in from the country. So, um, you know, it, you're right. If you see something, you better. It's 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 worth your time to find out what actually happened. So, um, this kind of applies across all the disciplines. And one of the questions that uh, that uh, we have is um, how how big an issue is herbicide drift to resistance development. And this would be any any kind of post-emerge product. Um, you know, does does that drift in between fields and and maybe lower concentration have any impact? So, Tom, you're you're up there, so maybe you want to start. Well, I, I think in general the answer is no, but I want to say something else though, Bruce. Um, on the edges of the field, we sometimes don't get a full dose. And a lot of times we attribute the half dose that we're getting on field edges and maybe weeds coming out of ditches and the like for starting weed resistance issues in fields. But, but, but back to the caller's question, um, I, I'm not worried about a drift situation. Um, usually the amount of pesticide in drift is very, very small. It's a sublethal dose anyway, and that that's not going to contribute to resistance at all. Okay. Um, Ian or, or Ken, do you want to comment on insecticides? Um, with regard to um, uh, with regard to drift, it's not as much of an issue with insecticides as it may be with with herbicides. Um, usually the, you know, the insect, uh, usually you've got targeted insecticide applications. So, um, you know, on one field, uh, if it's drifting over to another field, um, chances are the insects that are in the one field that you, you needed to treat are probably there as well. But I don't think it's, it's, I don't think I've seen data to say that it's a, as much an issue. Okay. Um, Dean, what about, what about you? And then, and then, uh, uh, maybe what about, uh, what about applying, uh, I'll kind of switch this up a little bit. What about applying, uh, a pesticide for one pest and then, uh, um, possibly developing resistance to another, another pest as process, whether that's drift or, or infield applications. Um, let's see, we may have lost Dean Melvick temporarily. Um, can, um, um, or I can see Ian, is, is anybody else on? We okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, first. we just lost Dean Melvick for for some for 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 some reason. Um, Ken, do you have any comments on that at all? Well, to circle back around real quick on the drift issue, I agree with what Ian was saying. There's really not a lot of pressure that's coming from drift issues. Um, as far as, you know, the whole approach of um, tank mixes and things like that to deal with pest issues, I know that Dean early on um, talked about, uh, you know, enhancing the spectrum of activity, and I know we see it uh, in insects when, you know, they're adding things to try to get a quicker kill or to um, 
perhaps uh, stave off development of resistance. And that's potentially a decent strategy as long as the rates being added are not you know, towards the sublethal side. So you, you need to make sure that the mixtures are having a full, full mix as opposed to partial mixes of both products. Um, and I know that didn't quite answer your question, Bruce. You wanna elaborate? Well, Bruce, I'd, I'd like to add also that circling back to what you had said about an, um, a non-targeted application where you're hitting an insect that is not necessarily, that's in the field, not necessarily targeted. That has a lot of data to say that, yeah, we've seen development of resistance to secondary pests and pests that weren't necessarily the target of applications. I just, I guess I wasn't thinking of that as drift, but that's probably the mechanism whereby we've got resistance in spider mites right now in soybeans. Um, you know, they, they've been exposed to the insecticide applications we've been doing against soybean aphids and they're usually in the margins most years, maybe not at high levels, but it means that those populations have been exposed to those insecticides for many years over and over. So yeah, that was actually a good point. I guess I just wasn't thinking about it, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, stuff that gets sprayed that wasn't necessarily targeted to get sprayed, yeah, certainly you can see resistance developing in those. And, and that goes back to the other key point in insect control. We like to see products go out where the populations actually justify the use of the mm -hmm. product as opposed to insurance type approaches where you're spraying um, you know, just extensively whether the populations warrant the spray application or not. I don't know if Dean's, uh, looks like he's on board. Dean, are you, are you there? All right. Um, Ken, you just you're you're uh, um, just on, but there's a question here on uh, volunteer corn and BT resistance. You know how how can how can volunteer corn uh, impact BT uh, resistance to BT? Well, it, volunteer corn provides a bridge in the sense that any eggs hatching that year now have a root system to feed on. So, you know, you could be getting uh, some production out of a field. Bruce, you and I had some studies out a while ago now where populations of, you know, even a, like 3,000 plants or more per acre were, were also recruiting enough egg laying that you could have damage the following year. So they're not only bridging the population in the field and, and reducing the effectiveness of the rotation, but they're also attracting in beetles that lay eggs that then could attack the next crop. And since a lot of these plants are silking later, um, typically, um, that means that they're that they're, sur they're recruiting from the surrounding area almost like a trap crop does. Um, so they may be pulling in beetles resistant in other fields and, and you may just be getting a source of resistant beetles um, because of that. I don't know if there's anything you wanna add, Bruce, based on your work. No, just that and, you know, we've got the same issue with volunteer soybeans, you know, it's, you know if, if you're not taking the volunteer soybeans out of corn, um, there's a, I've got a little bit of data that suggests that you can basically eliminate your rotation effect for soybean cyst nematode that way. Um, you know, depending on how the corn segregates or, or, or uh, in, the, in the volunteers or um, if you, you know what resistance you have in the soybean cyst nematode uh, volunteers, um, you're actually you're actually doing uh, continuous selection pressure that way on, on those pests just through the volunteers. So, um, you know, it, there's a you know there there is a there is a point for having monocultures when it comes to uh, pest management to a certain extent. At least not not. Uh, not having volunteers uh, following through the next year. Um, 
Can your guests please address how throwing a fungicide or an insecticide in with a post-emerge herbicide might relate to resistance? Uh, and also address droplet size and efficacy. Um, so that, la that last part of that, the droplet size and efficacy is, is one of the you know, things that uh, uh, Dan brought up as far as you know, getting, doing the is, was the application done right? And uh, you know, I'll let, uh, uh, let you guys address uh, maybe you know, some, of the, some of the negative aspects of, of you know, mixing, mixing insecticides and fungicides in with post-emerge herbicide. Um, so, maybe, maybe Bruce, we'll keep, we'll, go ahead. Bruce, I'd like to start from the weeds. You're, you're, Tom, Tom, you're, you're breaking Tom, up pretty bad. Um, so, we're um, just starting to make fungicide applications and sugar beets okay. in Southern men. Okay, I haven't changed anything. I don't know what happened. Yeah, you're um, back, you're back. Okay, so I want to talk about sugar beets. So we're just starting to make fungicide applications. And a very common producer question is, hey, can I combine the first fungicide application with my last glyphosate application? So let's start with the fungicides. We're uh, applying them at a very high water volume usually uh, 20 gallons, maybe even 25 gallons. And we want a very small droplet spectrum. So contrast that to the herbicide application. Um, we don't want to apply glyphosate at 25 gallons. And we prefer to have a larger droplet spectrum because glyphosate translocates. We don't have to get um, as good a coverage as you do with a fungicide situation. So trying to save a trip in the field and um, take out two birds with one stone, in this case, um, I can't say a lot for the fungicide side, but it is absolutely not helping you from a resistance management side with glyphosate. With glyphosate, you need to make the application to optimize glyphosate activity. And that's uh, using the right droplet spectrum, using the right spray volume, using the right adjuvants, that sort of thing. So I really want to stress the point, Bruce, separate your late pesticide applications where your weeds are probably already big already. So you want to do everything you can to get that right from your first fungicide application. Bruce, I'll stop right there. Thanks, Tom. Um, so Dan, you, you, uh, you work one-on-one -on -one with growers and, and uh, how tempting is it to, to try to save a trip over the field? And how, well, and how economic do you guy. out of it? Right. I mean, it's totally economics, but I mean, the, the prime example that comes into play here is fungicide on soybeans. If you're planning an R3 application and, oh, there's a few aphids out there, let's throw it together. I mean, that's like we all would uh, say that that happens a lot when it shouldn't, you know, and I got guys that will definitely, they have their own systems, their own haggies, John Deere's, whatever, and it's like they will definitely separate them out and do it at the proper time. However, you know, if you're hiring the co-op or whoever, and it's like you're looking at strictly at the dollars and not long term, there's a lot that gets thrown together. So that's exactly, you know, Tom's point on that. It may not be proper timing for either one of those, but you do, they do the half job of doing that right. And that's where we have problems on both of them down the road. Great point. That happens a lot. 
Okay. Um, there's one question here on uh, current recommendations for soybean aphid control while reducing selection for resistance. I'll, I'll start out and then turn it over to uh, Ken and Ian. But uh, basically, I think we have to assume that, that at least uh, there's a high likelihood of at least part of that aphid population in, that, in a field now uh, being uh, resistant to, to prethroid insecticides. Um, so we're, we're losing, kind of losing that uh, uh, class of chemistry for soybean aphid management. There are some new, newer products uh, that, that can be used. They're not as broad spectrum as, as the prethroids were. Um, there, you know, things like Safina and, and uh, Transform are more a little more targeted. They're look, good thing is they're they're less detrimental to benef beneficials. But um, I think the I think the key from my perspective to avoid resistance to soybean aphids is don't spray fields if you don't have a problem. So, uh, Ken Ian, do you have anything to add to that? Bruce, I was just gonna ask a, a question based on the results you've seen with the newer products. It's my impression that they need to be used a little differently than the classic, you know, late rescue situations we find ourselves sometimes in. Um, and that's a little different than the earlier topic about, you know, timing of mixes and things like that. But could you comment on, you know, is there a need to shift how you approach using some of these newer products compared to like a Lohr's band or pyrethroid? Um, well, if you're talking about spider mites and things like agrimec and zeal, that's probably true. Um, they don't control adults very well. They're more targeted for, for uh, immatures and, and eggs. Um, soybean aphids, uh, the newer the newer compounds are pretty pretty effective. Um, uh, there may be a little slower control, but the control is still good. Um, okay. uh, for example, Safina is, you know, it, it it basically inter interferes with their motor motor skills to a certain extent, and they they starve to death. So they may be hanging on those plants for a while, and uh, and. Uh, you know, but they're not feeding anymore and it just takes them a little while to, to fall off. Um, one of the ways that when we look at resistant soybean aphids, where we're rating aphids and we're counting aphids per plant, um, you know, what we're always do is shake a plant first before we start counting because some of those aphids are still on the plant. They're, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not feeding anymore. Um, and, and that way you don't, you don't include them in the count. So, Ian? No, I, I concur with you, Bruce. One of the most important things is to just not spray it if you, unless you really need to. Um, I think this kind of early spraying, you know, spray early, spray often sort of thing can, can get us into a lot of trouble. Um, also in soybean, this is a crop where our insecticide toolbox is getting increasingly shallow. Uh, we have a couple of new products that have come on, but you know, we've, we've lost pyrethroids to resistance. There's deregistration of products. And so um, while the, the newer products, like you had said, work very well, the Transform, the Savanto, and the, the, the Safina, um, at the same time, you know, it's you want to keep those around as long as you can. We don't want to be in the same boat as, as you know, where we've gotten. So I, I think you hit the nail right in the head. You've really got to make sure you're scouting, make sure you know what your populations are, and only treat if you really need to, if you're over those economic thresholds. I think I think that's kind of a you know the biggest take home message in the in, in all this resistance management is is uh, don't poke the bear and and in other words if you don't have a problem um, you're just asking for trouble if you're if you're uh, if you're applying pesticides and, and you don't need it and I know that's a little different with things like weeds and and diseases and maybe to a certain extent corn rootworm because you're you're doing your, your uh, pesticide application before um, that, that population is actually to the point where it's doing damage. Um, you're kind of shooting ahead of the curve, but even there, I think, uh, you know, even in with herbicides, do, you, you know, selecting the right, the right products is, is gonna help you out quite a bit. So um, 
One question here I've got for younger farmers who may see something they question regarding resistance. Should they call their county extension office first? Um, yeah, the, the extension or, uh, you know, one of us or, or uh, your, your consultant or advisor, I mean, you know, get it checked out and don't wait till next year when it's worse. Um, Tom, there's one question here on what are the latest weed resistance tolerance issues in the state? Bruce, can you hear me okay? Yep, now we can. I'm going to keep my video off. Maybe the bandwidth was the issue before. So, so certainly water hemp is the one that stands out. Um, water hemp has traveled from southern Minnesota and is all the way up through west central Minnesota, uh, the Red River, Red River Valley, up to the Canada border. So that's probably number one on our list. Um, the ragweed are, are resistant to glyphosate. And by the way, on water hemp, um, it's not only glyphosate resistance, but it's a host of other active ingredients. And you can go down the list. Um, we have some challenges with, um, um, with, with um, um, a number of different families there. Um, um, group 27s, um, there's been some evidence of group 15 resistance, um, oxen herbicide resistance, the triazine. So quite a number of, of families there with that one. Um, probably the newest one that we're worried about is Palmer Amor, new and different to Minnesota, but it's also a weed that has resistant biotypes. So that one is a double whammy for our producers. One that isn't resistant, Bruce, is common lambs quarters. So I brought that one up earlier. Um, our challenges with common lambs quarters is it, it, it's just very difficult for a post-emergence herbicide to penetrate penetrate the, the cuticle, especially on more of a performance issue with comments issue. I'll stop right there, Bruce. Okay, thanks. Well, we're about, we're about out of time. Um, and uh, any, uh, any closing comments from many of the panelists? Dean, are you on yet? Oh yeah, I've been, I've been here for 20 minutes. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I was, you, you weren't responding, so. Um, we talked a little bit about the SDHI uh, um, fungicides. Anything else we should be worried about as far as resistance? Well, I, I think I, I hit on the main points. You know, a lot of this, the comments already made about insecticides and herbicides certainly apply to fungicides too. You know, and the more we apply them, the, the higher the risk is of developing resistance over time. And so that's always a risk of applying fungicides when there's no significant disease to control. There still may be a population of the pathogen that's not causing you know, significant problems for yield, but there could be enough there to start developing resistance. So that's, that's another factor that, that I think we need to consider in this whole um, application of fungicides for yield benefit in the absence of disease idea. Um, so those, I, I think, I think a lot of the other key points I've already made. Um, droplet size certainly has an effect too. Um, you know, one of the more common applications for fungicides in Minnesota is for white mold, and they did some interesting research up at North Dakota in, at Carrington Research Station. They they found that near closure of the canopy, the coarser droplets were actually more effective, even though there are fewer of them the coarser ones were more effective at controlling white mold. Whereas when the canopy was more open, medium or two or, or slightly uh, smaller droplets were actually more effective. So it really does apparently matter um, 
and based on how thick the canopy is, whether it's coarse or fine droplets would be more effective. So there, there are a lot of factors and they also tested different kinds of nozzles and that made a difference too. So there are a number of factors to think about. Um, I mentioned white mold, not because resistance is a major issue, although there's been some evidence and some other states of reduced sensitivity to fungicides for white mold, that doesn't seem to be a major factor in how effective fungicides are for controlling white mold in soybean. Okay, I've got, uh, we're running out of time here, but I've got one last question that we probably better address just considering the year. And that is, does spraying herbicides in the heat like we had the last couple of weeks add to resistance issue at all, issues at all, since it seems like the weed kill was a little less effective than usual? Anybody want to tackle that? Hey, Bruce, um, the reason why, Bruce, can you hear me? Uh, you're breaking up, Tom. Okay. Why don't you answer that for me then? Go ahead, Bruce. Um, well, I don't know it's necessarily adding to resistance. Um, because, uh, and you can tell me if I'm wrong because it's an it's a, it's a, um, application issue more than an than a, um, efficacy, uh, 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 met metabolism issue or, or a, a resistance issue in the weed itself. Um, that's how I would look at it, but I'm not, I'm not a weed scientist. So you could, you could tell me if I'm different. I know yeah. some of the insecticides, the pyrethroids, for example, real hot, humid weather, they're, they're, they're less efficacious. They don't stick around as long, uh, that sort of thing. But, um, I, you, you, you'd be better to ask, answer that, that herbicide perspective. Tom. Can you hear me, Bruce? Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of, am I coming Okay. You're real. You're slow, but we can the hear you. The bottom line is when it oh, no, we lost you completely. Hot weed slowed down. They're designed to protect themselves from adverse conditions. Right. So what you're, Bruce, maybe we can write and talk about that at some other time. Yeah, yeah, it's, you're, you're, it says your bandwidth is too low. So you're saying, you're saying it's, there, it's, not, a, it's not a resistance issue. It's just that the weeds, the weeds themselves are trying to protect themselves and they're and they're and and it's a uh, and they're and, and that's that's the reason that the efficacy is is maybe a little bit less. Is that correct? That's exactly what I'm saying, Bruce. That's okay. exactly what's happening. All right. It helps if you don't know what you're talking about. You can summarize a lot quicker. So. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey, Bruce. Yes. I was just going to bring up one point real quick on um, the parting thought for me was. Uh, you know, as you're dealing with uh, the potential for mixed pest situations right now and, and the drier weather, um, so soybean aphid control and the potential for a two-spotted spider mite um, outbreak during prolonged droughts kind of go hand in hand and, and some of the actions that may be taken like throwing a insecticide in with a tank mix, uh, going out with a fungicide okay. may not actually need it, are potentially going to either, you know, blow up uh, soybean aphid populations or potentially trigger a mite outbreak. Yeah, and the weather's, the weather's looking pretty mite-ish right now. So um, yeah, it's, I, I guess that's, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, Ian mentioned spider mites and aphid spraying. I think that's you know one of the reasons we've selected for some spider mite resistance and and uh, you know definitely some some you know maybe overuse of of insecticides uh, certainly certainly uh, encourage the development of resistance to pyrethroids. Um, anybody else have a have a last uh, comment? 
Okay. Um, well, I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us today. Uh, uh, hopefully, it was useful to the, the you know you guys that are listening in. Uh, please share, share your feedback with us in the evaluation. Emily put a link to that in the chat. Um, so um, once again, thank you and and. Uh, Uh, hopefully we'll see you next uh, next month on advancing egg thank you thanks Bruce